Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome uh, to tonight's presentation, our uh, guest lecture. Uh, our lecture is actually going to be recorded and live streamed to the Red Cross YouTube channel and highlights of the evening will also be available on Swinburne and the Red Cross website. With this in mind, can I ask you to please switch your mobile phones to silent before we begin? Now, in the event of emergency, please note the exits in, on both sides of the room and staff will direct you to the nearest fire escape if the need should arise. My name's Professor Gavin Lambert. I'm the director of the Iverson Health Innovation Research Institute here at Swinburne University of Technology. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's public lecture, Loneliness, a 21st Century Challenge. I would first like to respectfully acknowledge the tradi traditional custodians of this land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay respects to their elders, past and present. It's now my privilege to welcome our Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Lyndon Christensen, AO. Thank you very much, Professor Lambert. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we're gathered this evening, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. It's my privilege to welcome you tonight to the public lecture on loneliness. And to introduce our speaker later, you'll hear from Professor Gavin Lambert. I would like to acknowledge our VIPs, Carrie McGraw, Director of Community Programs, Australian Red Cross. Professor Julian Holt Lundstad, Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Brigham Young University. Members of the Australian Coalition to End Loneliness. Colleagues, and friends. Thank you very much for being with us tonight and a special thanks to the Australian Red Cross for co-hosting this evening's lecture. We will explore loneliness and how it affects us and how we as a society can respond to try and address this challenge. Research confirms what we know in our hearts. Loneliness is bad for your health. In fact, it can be as harmful as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Swinburne researchers are playing a central role in an Australian initiative to address this issue. Under the leadership of Professor Gavin Lambert, in his role as director of the Hi Iverson Health Innovation Research Institute, we are working alongside our community organization partners and industry to make a difference in the lives of those who are experiencing loneliness. Swinburne is privileged to have one of Australia's most prominent loneliness research experts Dr. Michelle Lim. Dr. Lim also chairs the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Australian Coalition to End Loneliness, or ACEL. In this role, Michelle uses her knowledge and expertise to develop and test interventions to address loneliness. Dr. Lim, Lim helped create a collaboration uh, and an alliance with researchers internationally and in Australia. She has also facilitated important cross-disciplinary connections across our Iverson Health Research Institute and also reached out to researchers in the Social Innovation Research Institute here at Swinburne. She has done this because loneliness is a complex issue and it requires a coordinated approach. This is allowing us to come up with a more innovative mindset to address this health challenge. An example of some of this work. In 2017, Swinburne worked with leading mental health service providers to trial a smartphone app and an intervention program designed to combat loneliness in young people. The Positive Connect app, as it's called, is designed to be used as part of a six-week program to encourage people to improve the quality of their relationships within their social circles and ultimately help conquer their loneliness. Initial evidence shows that this type of positive approach may be able to reduce loneliness in young people. We're delighted tonight to have Dr. Julian Holt Lundstedt, Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Brigham Young University here to deliver tonight's lecture. We trust that tonight's lecture and the work that we commit to together as we muster our capabilities to address this long-term health 
effect uh, of loneliness will, will really make a difference. So thank you all for being here tonight, and please join me now in welcoming Kerry McGraw, Director of the Community Programs at the Australian Red Cross, who will share her thoughts. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, we know that loneliness affects over half of us at some stage in our life, and that 80% of us think that it's actually getting worse. Our experience at Australian Red Cross in working in communities in uh, capital centres, regional centres, and remote communities across Australia really bears witness to, to us seeing more people becoming lonely and losing their social connections. It is an absolute privilege to be part of tonight's events and to be partnering with Swinburne University for this event and to hear directly from Professor Julianne Holt Lunset Lundstedt, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing your speech. We support this critical discussion on loneliness as a major public health issue, impacting on our health and wellbeing. Julianne, in a minute, will explain the extent to which loneliness affects a person's health outcomes. These are significant. We are pleased, as I said, to be partnering with Swinburne not only for tonight's events, but indeed we're building a uh, healthy connections model which we believe could be quite uh, cutting edge, really to combat loneliness and build up people's connections and resilience. We are also very privileged to be partnering with the Australian Coalition coalition to end loneliness, working with them to increase the conversations and discussions, to share ideas and de develop solutions on how we address this, this issue. At Australian Red Cross, we, have, um, we want to do more. We've prioritised this in our current and future plans. Importantly, we're listening to the people who have this experience in their life. They know what the solutions are. We're trialling different approaches to see what impact we can have on improving social connections to each other. We're combining the thoughts of those with lived experience with the research that we'll hear more about tonight, emerging both from here in Australia and indeed from overseas, to, de to, de 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 to develop some very clear insights which are important. The most important insights that we've learned to date, which are still emerging, there's five that we're, we've learned. Firstly, that loneliness is subjective. It's a feeling. It's a signal to connect to people, like thirst is to water. Secondly, loneliness happens at life transitions, which is the trigger for loneliness. And it's a time when it thrives. Thirdly, there are opportunities in our networks. Having more friends, as we know, doesn't necessarily mean that you're less lonely. It's the quality of those connections. They're meaningful connections. They're, they're connections where care exists versus the quality of the quantity of connections that most of us have through social media. Fourthly, loneliness it can be a habit. And if it's not dealt with, it can lead to chronic loneliness, which becomes a real issue. And fifth, and this is very significant, loneliness does not discriminate. It's all ages, it's all different genders, uh, different cultural groups, uh, different contexts, uh, does not discriminate. So how can we think and act differently, drawing on the evidence how can we use our collective and complementary strengths to address this insidious health and social issue in our communities? Thank you so much for being part of tonight. It's a fantastic turn up. Uh, clearly a lot of interest in this topic and it's so fantastic that you're here. Thank you again to Swinburne for, for co-hosting this event with us. And I'm really, really looking forward to Julianne's um, ad address shortly. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, very much, Kerry, and thanks again to the Australian Red Cross for supporting this evening's venture. It's now my pleasure to introduce the main event for this evening, Professor Julianne holt Lundsted. Uh, I'm sure that all of you have read Julianne's biography. Uh, uh, she's one of the most uh, foremost authorities on the, on the area of social connectedness and also loneliness, but importantly also the physiological consequences of loneliness. Uh, you also may be aware, it wasn't written in Julianne's biography, that she is, uh, or there has been appointed in the UK a Minister for Loneliness, and Julianne happens to be on the Scientific Executive Advisory Committee for that particular uh, minister. I would now very much like to welcome Julianne to the podium. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you all for coming here today. I want to start first by thanking Iverson Health Innovation Institute, uh, Social Innovation Research Institute, Australian Red Cross, Swinburne Research, and, advan and Advancement Team uh, for not only inviting me here, but for raising awareness around this issue. Uh, this is, uh, I also want to thank some of my collaborators, uh, particularly Tim Smith, uh, Dave Sabara, and uh, Ted Robles for their uh, their collaboration on the work that I'm going to be discussing with you today. <clears throat> I want you to first start by imagining your most significant relationship. And I want you to think about how this makes you feel. For most of us, it's not surprising that our relationships can have a significant influence on our emotional well-being. Uh, however, uh, for most of us, we don't recognize that this also can have a significant influence on our physical health and even our longevity. Social connection uh, has often been thought of as a biological need uh, linked to survival. And if some of you are wondering what that blob on the screen is, it's a uh, group of birds, a uh, starling. And we see across species that being part of a group serves important functions, whether it is direction to safety, evading a predator, uh, pooling of resources, uh, protection from the elements, uh, reciprocal altruism, or obtaining food, or even comfort, that these functions have been directly tied to survival. This notion uh, that social connection is a fundamental biological need uh, has also been uh, advanced by uh, social neuroscientists. In particular, John Cassiopo has argued that social connection uh, is much like water and food, that it is essential to our survival, and that loneliness is this adaptive biological urge that motivates us to reconnect. Neuroscience evidence su uh, supports this notion. Uh, for instance, that when we are faced with threats in our environment, uh, we use more metabolic resources when we are alone than when we are with other when we are with others, particularly trusted others. Also, data suggests that social pain. Carry, shares similar neural pathways as biological pain or physical pain. In fact, social isolation or loneliness can be so distressing that uh, social isolation or social confinement has been used as punishment and even torture. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Recently, we've seen news headlines around the world from the US to the UK, Germany, and even here in Australia, uh, suggesting that chronic loneliness is a modern day epidemic. And uh, as mentioned earlier, the UK has recently appointed a minister for loneliness. And yet we look to major medical organizations uh, and most of them do not explicitly acknowledge this as a uh, social indicator of health or a social determinant of health. Uh, and also, the majority of the general public do not recognize this as something that is important to their health. So today, what I want to do is to summarize the evidence around this issue. And is there sufficient evidence to support this notion of a loneliness epidemic? And if so, should this be considered a social determinant of health and be prioritized in public health? I will also address some of the potential barriers that we face uh, and, and hopefully provide some kinds of recommendations for where we can go from here. I think it's important to first uh, recognize and acknowledge what we mean by prioritization. Because for some, when they hear the, the term prioritization, they may uh, think that we're referring to large-scale interventions uh, or government legislation. And uh, understandably, this is often uh, perceived as premature, naive, uh, or even unnecessary government involvement in personal matters. But what, is really, what I really mean here by prioritization is simply uh, allocating resources, time, and energy to those issues that are deemed most critical and practical to address. And this is uh, the de definition for prioritization from the Centers for Disease Control. And so as I evaluated the evidence for this, I looked to the criteria that public health uses to determine what gets prioritized. With limited resources, uh, there, there has to be uh, prioritization here. And so the criteria that's used is the size of the problem, the seriousness of the problem, and the estimated effectiveness of the solution. So before we can actually evaluate these criteria, we need to define the problem. So what exactly is the issue? Is it the perception of loneliness? Is it lacking social contact, interaction, or perceived support? Maybe the problem is lacking a close, uh, intimate partner or someone in the home that you can rely on in times of need. Or maybe the problem is being in a strained relationship where there's a lot of conflict or lacking supportive relationships. I hope you can see that even by this incomplete list, that uh, without a clear definition, uh, this is a major barrier to prioritization. So in order to, to determine uh, how to define this, we can look to how it's been measured across studies and in research. And of course, as you can imagine, it's been measured in a variety of ways. Uh, these can be generally broken down into three major categories, structural, functional, and quality aspects of relationships. So the structural aspects of relationships include the existence or interconnections of relationships or roles. Uh, so some examples might be size of social network, marital status, uh, or living alone. In essence, these structural me uh, measures get at the presence or absence of others in your life. The next major category is uh, functional, which gets at the resources that either are uh, um, provided or perceived to be available uh, through your social relationships. So examples of this might be received and perceived support, as well as perceived loneliness. And then finally, uh, there are indicators of quality. And as we can all probably personally uh, recognize, not all relationships are positive. And so the positive and negative aspects of relationships need to be taken into account. 
And so measures of this include uh, relationship satisfaction, conflict, strain, and ambivalence. Importantly, all of these have been linked to physical health outcomes and uh, linked to risk. However, there are low correlations among them meaning that they are tapping into distinctly different aspects of our relationships. Therefore, to try and uh, address this barrier to prioritization, my colleagues and I have proposed the term social connection as an umbrella term to capture the structural, functional, and quality aspects of our relationships. In essence, it's the way in which we connect to others physically and behaviorally, the way in which we connect to others cognitively, and the way in which we connect to others emotionally. And we can think of this as being on a continuum from high social connection, which would be associated with low risk or protection, to low social connection, which would be associated with high risk. Therefore, we define the problem as lacking social connection or social disconnection, and loneliness would be one indicator of that. So getting back to the criteria of what, uh, what it takes to, to be prioritized in, in public health, we can look to the size of the problem. So in other words, is there evidence that a significant portion of the population lacks social connection? And uh, I should mention that precise estimates are sometimes difficult to obtain because uh, one major problem is that this is not routinely assessed at a population level. But we can look to nationally, nationally rep representative samples. So uh, for instance, in the US, approximately 35% of adults uh, are lonely. Uh, in the UK, more than three quarters of GPs say that they see between one and five lonely people per day. Uh, but we can also look to demographics. So these are uh, estimates that we do have uh, population-wide uh, data on. So for instance, more than a quarter of the population lives alone. Uh, less than half of the population are married. Uh, there are uh, decreases in social network size, and approximately 40% of marriages um, uh, end in divorce, and 70% of remarriages end in divorce. So I want to first just mention that while these demographic factors may be considered crude indicators, because of course you can be living alone, unmarried, uh, don't have children, and, and still be socially connected. But nonetheless, these kinds of indicators are uh, a type of safety net. Uh, and these indicators are robustly associated with risk. So although I mentioned many US stats, uh, unfortunately, the Australians aren't doing much better. Uh, and, and so uh, from uh, on an Australian perspective, approximately a quarter of Australians live alone. 32% of females and 44% of males are at clinical risk for social isolation. And 60% say they often feel lonely. So how does this stack up to these other kinds of issues that are prioritized in public health? So if we look at these orange bars, the top one being loneliness and that middle one being living alone, we can see that this is on par with things such as obesity, physical inactivity, the percentage of adult smokers, and even severe obesity. So these, uh, the percentage of popula in the population is on par with these other factors that are taken quite seriously. But is there evidence of urgency? In other words, is there evidence that loneliness and social isolation are increasing? So it's difficult when we look specifically at loneliness because this is often measured in different ways and the percentages can vary from uh, sample to sample. But there is some evidence to suggest that adults re reporting being lonely uh, has doubled since uh, the 1980s. But again, if we look to some of these demographic factors, we see that living alone is not only risen, 
but is at the highest levels in recorded history. We have uh, fewer people who are getting married, uh, increasing rates of childlessness, uh, and the average social network has declined by a third. If we take this uh, together with an increasing aging population, what this suggests is that there will be fewer familial resources to draw upon in older age. And again, Australian uh, prevalence rates show similar trends. So we have strong evidence that there's a significant portion of the population that lacks social connection, and it appears to be increasing. But we also need to really uh, critically evaluate the seriousness of the problem. And one of the major ways in which this is assessed is risk for premature mortality. So my colleagues and I, uh, to uh, address this, we looked at the epidemiological data on this. Uh, in other words, we, we looked at the kinds of studies where they measure social connection in a large population and follow them over time to see whether it predicts who lives or dies. And so in these studies, people were followed for years, if not decades. And uh, we looked at all of the evidence available worldwide and combined this data statistically using meta-analytic methods. Uh, and so meta-analytic -ana methods, in essence, give us an estimate of the cumulative effect uh, because they, don't, they aren't reliant on any one sample or some of the characteristics associated with that. So just to kind of put this into perspective, if we take the analogy of shopping online, um, we often want a product not only that gets high ratings, but we have much more confidence in ordering a product that has lots of reviews. Um, we might be a little bit more skeptical about a product that maybe still has a positive review, but only, say, one, um, uh, one review. And similarly, this is how we should treat scientific evidence. Um, we should have much more confidence uh, in those that are based on, on large samples and large numbers of studies, uh, and be a bit more skeptical and, and not buy into the kinds of findings that um, may only be based on one study. So uh, my colleagues and I have uh, thus far uh, uh, published two separate meta-analyses looking at these. And so the first one of these uh, included 148 studies with over 300,000 participants. And the second one included 70 studies with over 3.4 million participants. And what we found in this first one that looked across a variety of measures uh, that indicate social connection what we found was that being more socially connected led to a 50% reduction in risk for, uh, for early mortality. And of course, this was adjusting for age and initial health status to rule out alternative hypotheses or uh, reverse causality. So what does 50% mean? Uh, many of us are constantly hearing the latest health finding, uh, that this or that is good or bad for us, but it becomes really difficult to put this all into perspective and to know what kinds of things we need to take seriously for our health. And so it was important for us to benchmark this relative to other uh, well-recognized uh, risk factors for mortality. So what this figure shows are some of these well-recognized factors, including things like smoking, uh, alcohol consumption, flu vaccine, uh, obesity, physical inactivity, and air pollution, and their relative effect on, on risk for premature mortality. And when we benchmark social connections relative to these other factors, what we can see is that not only are they comparable to these uh, hallowed risk factors, but in many cases, uh, this exceeds it. So just to put this into perspective, uh, the one comparison that seems to get a lot of uh, traction is that lacking social connections carries a similar risk to smoking up to 15 cigarettes per day. However, as you noticed, there were many others. 
This also exceeds the risk associated with physical inactivity. It exceeds the risk associated with obesity, with air pollution, et cetera. Importantly, since this was published, there's been even more data that has been published. And so we have even more evidence supporting this. Uh, in fact, we now have hundreds of studies with millions of participants supporting this. So uh, I've tabled here for you all of this evidence. Of course, I don't uh, expect you to be able to read all of it, but I do want to point out a few uh, highlights. So one thing to point out is that this, this is data linking a variety of ways of looking at social connection in terms of risk for premature mortality. And uh, they vary to some degree, uh, but uh, uh, one of the lowest predictors was received support. Uh, and the highest was complex measures of social integration. So while averaged across these indicators, the, it was uh, associated with a 50% increase odds of survival. On this measure, it was a 91% increase odds of survival. Uh, and these complex measures take into account these m multiple factors, uh, suggesting that there may be some additive effects of these different components of relationships. So in my second meta-analysis, I wanted to address the question of whether it is objective or subjective isolation that seems to be most predictive of, of mortality. And this has become a debate in the field uh, and, and, and a question I certainly often get because uh, it's important to recognize that um, uh, we can be objectively isolated, so we may have few relationships or um, infrequent social contact. But then there's also the subjective side, the perception of being isolated, the perception of being alone, alone, alone or the uh, discrepancy between one's desired level of social connection and one's actual level. So when we compared across uh, loneliness, social isolation, and living alone, what we found was that each of these significantly predicted risk for premature mortality and they equivalently predicted risk for premature mortality, suggesting that both objective and subjective isolation are important. Interestingly, we compared the effect sizes of the, the, the low end of the spectrum. So these are all indicators of social deficits or social disconnection. And we compared that to the high end, the indicators of social connection um, uh, or complex social integration. And what we found was that uh, uh, the, the social deficits um, carried a significantly smaller overall effect relative to uh, these others. What that suggests is that the protective effects or the benefits of being socially connected are even stronger than the detriments or risk associated with lacking. And here again, I just uh, put uh, the comparison between these variety of ways of looking at social connection in orange relative to the well-recognized uh, risk factors for mortality in blue. And as we can see, they vary in their strength uh, in terms of predictiveness. But even the lowest of, of these, which was interestingly uh, loneliness, even that one is significantly uh, great, uh, has a significantly higher effect in terms of predicting mortality compared to physical inactivity, obesity, and air pollution. These are factors that c receive considerable attention in terms of public health prioritization resources and attention. So just to summarize what the evidence tells us, we have uh, robust evidence of, of the effect relative to other risk factors. And I should note that these effects are consistent across age, gender, initial health status, cause of death, and country of origin. Uh, we also have evidence that both subjective and objective indicators predict risk and that this is uh, a 
the, the evidence supports a continuous effect, not a dichotomous one. So it's not that you being lonely or not lonely, but rather on a spectrum. Uh, importantly, there's no evidence to suggest a threshold effect. So what do I mean by that? So there is uh, often the perception that only lacking social connection or so being socially disconnected carries risk. And that if you somehow are able to achieve uh, some th thresholds, uh, in fact, I'm often asked, just how many friends do I need for a health benefit? <laughs> uh, as if there was this magic number and once you achieve that, you're okay. Um, but it also has the implication that once you reach that threshold, there's no added benefit beyond that. Uh, and in, in fact, the data supports more of a continuum effect. Uh, so there seems to be more of a gradual effect and there does seem to be some benefit beyond um, uh, with, with greater social connection as well. And uh, in fact, there's uh, uh, data from four nationally representative samples uh, that uh, shows a dose response effect both in early life as well as in late life. So many of you may be wondering, well, but how exactly does this happen? How is it that we go from interacting or not interacting um, with others and somehow living longer or living less? How exactly does this happen? So of course, researchers are interested in the pathways by which our relationships can influence our physical health. And there are many. <laughs> I'm just gonna highlight a few. Some of the most well-recognized pathways are through our our health behaviors or lifestyle factors. Uh, so our relationships can promote healthy behaviors uh, as well as uh, deter risky behaviors. So for instance, our relationships may encourage us to eat better, to quit smoking, uh, to get more sleep, to go see a doctor when needed, uh, or to um, take our medicine. But I should note that all of the evidence that I just presented, these studies statistically controlled for lifestyle factors. Uh, meaning that our relationships have an effect over and above any effect that our behaviors have on, on our health. Uh, and so there are a number of other ways in which our relationships can, can influence health. And so this includes uh, things such as, uh, uh, oops, uh, stress reduction. Uh, our relationships can either help us um, cope with our stress so that we uh, are less likely to suffer the negative health effects of stress, um, or they may be sources of stress. Uh, our relationships can provide a sense of safety and security that can influence the degree to which we perceive our environment as threatening. And then, of course, the, the um, physiological responses that occur as a result. Our relationships also provide a sense, keeps advancing without me. Um, uh, our relationships also provide a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. And this, of course, can lead to uh, better self-care and less risk-taking. Uh, and Experimental evidence, some of the strongest evidence that allows us to make causal inferences also shows that our relationships can have a direct influence on health-relevant physiology, including cardiovascular, neuroendocrine, and immune functioning. This could even influence cellular aging, uh, as well as quality of life indicators such as rate of cognitive decline. So we have strong evidence that being socially connected or lacking social connection influences our physical health and even our longevity. The big challenge we have now is what do we do about it? The evidence is clear, but we now face an incredible challenge of uh, finding effective solutions.
One particular challenge is identifying those who we should be targeting. So here are a list of some of the potential risk factors, and this includes things such as poor health and well-being, life transitions, uh, role loss and change, societal barriers, a lack of access or inequality, as well as communication barriers such as untreated hearing loss and language barriers. But what do we know about the effectiveness of interventions? So my colleagues and I are currently wrapping up another meta-analysis looking at all of the data that has examined uh, the extent to which interventions have been successful in reducing risk for premature mortality. And I'm not going to go into details because um, this is still uh, unpublished at this point, but what I can tell you is that uh, the data is mixed. And the overall results are modest compared to the epidemiological findings. So what we are now faced with is going through this data and trying to pick out and identify what works and what doesn't. Because importantly, it needs to be recognized that not all efforts have been successful. So I want to point out some of the implications from, because there seems to be some gaps between the epidemiological evidence that supports the importance of it and the, the practices that are being implemented to try and reduce risk. And so one of the, the factors to recognize is that most of this epidemiological evidence is based on existing close relationships. And yet most of the interventions are utilizing strangers uh, or hired personnel. Now that's not to say that these aren't um, ever successful. In fact, there are some that are successful. Uh, but what we don't understand is what are the factors that are contributing to why this might be successful in some cases and not in others. So for instance, it may be successful for those who lack uh, an existing social network, um, but may be less so for those who have an existing social network that they can draw upon, and perhaps efforts to foster those relationships may be more effective. Uh, we also need to acknowledge relationship quality has been linked to risk. And if these interventions are not taking into account relationship quality and are increasing social contact among relationships where there may be conflict or strain, this may actually have unintended negative effects. And so if we can focus on posi uh, 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 fostering positivity in these relationships, uh, we may uh, strengthen the effects of these uh, interventions. There's also the question of whether to be focusing on loneliness or isolation. Uh, and uh, it's important, as I mentioned before, to recognize that these are not the same. And so um, efforts to address them uh, may be successful for one, but not the other. So for instance, increasing social contact may address social isolation, but may not necessarily reduce loneliness. We also need to acknowledge that this is a multi-factor uh, uh, factor, uh, concept. And so a multi-factor approach is, is needed. So I think I often uh, get a little bit of pushback when it comes to this because this is often sometimes viewed as something that's really complex and that this is a barrier to addressing this in, in interventions uh, or more broadly in terms of public health. Uh, but we need to acknowledge that most major public health issues are also multifactorial concepts that also don't have a single causal mechanism. So I just use an, as an example obesity. Uh, just. Uh, some, of the, some of the potential uh, causal mechanisms include nutrition, physical activity, genetics, environmental factors. Uh, and so we can see from these others that uh, we, we can still focus on addressing this despite its complexity. But there's also the recognition that some of these factors may be more modifiable than others.
So this is a simplified model of some of the pathways um, that, that relationships may uh, influence health. And similarly, some of these pathways may be more modifiable than others. And so when we think about the kinds of interventions we design, uh, we can uh, take this into account. So if we go back to that original analogy brought up in the beginning of uh, social connection as a fundamental human need, this was actually uh, proposed by John Cassiopo, um, who is a prominent um, loneliness researcher that recently passed away. He was also my, uh, my academic grandfather. Uh, and uh, so I want to extend his analogy. So as you recall, he, he made the analogy that um, uh, loneliness is adaptive and that it is uh, l much like hunger and thirst that it motivates us to seek out uh, social connections. And so we can think of this, um, think of isolation, social isolation, as the objective lack of relationships, kind of like the objective lack of food or water. Loneliness can be seen as the symptom or the motivation. But just like we need food and water to survive, water can be tainted, food can be spoiled, and that quality needs to be taken into account. And so as we think about our interventions, we need to take into account not only the symptom, but the underlying cause with the recognition that not all um, may be of equal quality. As we think about the kinds of interventions we design, we also need to recognize that most of the interventions that have been uh, implemented thus far are very individual based. And, uh, and, and if we look to other kinds of public health factors, we've seen that there's been much less success in terms of individual based interventions. And where they have seen more success has been in preventative efforts and uh, community or societal based interventions. And so, for instance, the uh, Centers for Disease Control uh, has uh, this figure that, in essence, uh, acknowledges this, that even among public health issues, uh, that these kinds of interventions have been associated with smaller effects. And so this is the smaller effects that we're seeing in these interventions is consistent with the smaller effects uh, that, we, that are also seen in other kinds of public health issues. We also need to recognize that um, individual level uh, interventions typically only target those that are on the extreme end. And of course, we need to address those that are at, uh, at, at highest risk. But we also need to recognize that there is a large portion of the distribution that is being ignored. And given that this has a continuous effect, uh, we're missing a large portion of the risk trajectory. So uh, by looking at more population-wide efforts, we may potentially shift the distribution, having a much larger effect in reducing risk population-wide. If we also borrow from public health, we can use the social ecological model that acknowledges that individuals are embedded within interpersonal levels, so family, friends, social networks, but also organizations, communities, and, and society, and that we are potentially missing important opportunities to intervene at these other levels. And so these are important opportunities uh, that we need to take advantage of. So uh, this past uh, year, recently, uh, the former U.S. Surgeon General in the U.S. Uh, has stated that loneliness is a growing health epidemic, and that making or that fostering social connection is should be a, a strategic uh, priority. So this gets back to the idea of what is government's role in this and what would a strategic priority entail? What are some potential policies and practices that could potentially uh, address this issue? Uh, so one of the recommendations that we make is for population surveillance. This means assessing risk at a population level 
Uh, the, in the US, the Institute of Medicine has recommended that this be assessed in all electronic health records. And despite this recommendation in 2016, it has yet to be implemented. Uh, so this is one way in which this can continue. Uh, from my understanding, this is something that the UK is currently working on. Another recommendation that we have is for consensus guidelines around social connection. We have guidelines on uh, nutrition, physical activity, and sleep. These help us as a population know and gauge how we're doing and recognize that these are part of an important, of, of a healthy lifestyle and helps us make these kinds of daily decisions. Similarly, we need something like this for social connection. Of course, this would need to be evidence-based and would need to be uh, uh, periodically reviewed uh, and reevaluated based on the latest evidence. And so much like these guidelines have evolved over time based on evidence, similarly, these guidelines would need to evolve over time. Uh, just to highlight a few other potential policy and practice recommendations, uh, by having these kinds of guidelines in place, this would change the national discussion around this as, a, as something that we need to take seriously for our health. This would have implications on education that would uh, go all the way from primary school to uh, medical school education. Uh, this could be implemented in healthcare, in the way in which our physicians uh, talk to patients and assess risk, as well as preventative efforts. This can be addressed in the workplace, whether it be through wellness programs or planning for retirement. We, have, we plan financially for retirement, but we need to plan socially for retirement. This can also be uh, influenced in terms of our built environment, the spaces that we design, and looking at the kinds of things and features that inhibit versus encourage social connection. This also means partnering with uh, community stakeholders and bridging those gaps between basic research and implementation. Now this really complicated circular graph, um, in essence really is just uh, demonstrating that as we think about our efforts, that we don't just jump from basic research to large scale interventions. That this needs to be systematic and that it needs to be um, modified at every level. And those dotted lines represent areas in need of caution and that at every level we refine and we improve uh, and, and, and if it doesn't work, we go back and try again. Um, and if it does work, how can it be done more efficiently and effectively? So I want to uh, tell you about one potential simple uh, uh, solution that has uh, been implemented in uh, the US. So, as I mentioned before, uh, there's the perception that government plays no role in this and that it may be uh, unnecessarily um, interfering in personal matters. Uh, and, that it, uh, and so uh, recently, well, actually last year, um, there was a congressional hearing at the Senate for Aging where a bill was introduced to make hearing aids more affordable. And as I mentioned, uh, hearing loss or untreated hearing loss is a significant risk factor for social isolation and loneliness. And this bill was introduced to make this um, not only more affordable, but more accessible over the counter. And uh, this was recently uh, signed into law. And so this is an example of where legislation can occur uh, where it doesn't necessarily take away from someone's personal choice, nor does it interfere in someone's privacy as well. So this may be one potential simple solution. And of course, we have yet to see whether it uh, um, does reduce isolation and loneliness, but it is a, an important effort and step in the right direction.
So in conclusion, um, we now have uh, significant evidence that social connection significantly increases our uh, risk for premature mortality, and that this is comparable with these other kinds of factors that are taken quite seriously in public health that uh, get significant attention and resources. We also have good evidence that not only does a significant portion of the population, um, are they affected by this, but this seems to be increasing. And while we, we face important challenges in terms of identifying uh, uh, interventions that will be effective in reducing risk, it'll only be through uh, greater, greater prioritization and resources that we will be able to truly tackle this, this important health issue. I want to close by introducing you to uh, someone that I met last summer. This is Julio, and uh, I met him in Sardinia, uh, one of the famed blue zones where uh, uh, people routinely live uh, beyond 100. Uh, in fact, in, in uh, this area, there is the largest uh, concentration of male centenarians in the world. And Julio, uh, as you can see, rides his bike daily. He rides about 15 kilometers daily. He, he still shops. Uh, he, he writes poetry. He's involved in local theater. Uh, in fact, uh, he's a bit of a local celebrity. <laughs> and he is anything but lonely. Uh, and I often joke with people that I want to be like him when I grow up. Uh, but after returning, I realized that if I want this kind of, not only a long life, but a high quality of life, that I can't wait until I'm older. I can't wait until after retirement. I need to make changes and profound changes now. And similarly, if we want to tackle this important issue of loneliness, we can't wait. We need to tackle this now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julianne. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to have just a, a small sort of discussion um, session for the remainder of, of the evening. So with Julianne's centre stage, uh, we'll invite Kerry back to the, the stage and also Michelle Lim. Now, Michelle uh, has uh, dual responsibilities at Swinburne. She's involved in student engagement. As you can Im imagine, the uh, concept of social connectedness is very important for engaging and retaining in students. And from a research point of view, uh, Michelle heads our loneliness research program. Um, now, I, I did have a list of questions, and of course I'm going to go rogue and just probably ignore all those particular questions. Uh, I was fascinated, Julianne, by uh, your, your, your data that you showed that loneliness was associated with increased mortality. Now, my understanding of the data that you showed, I, I assume that was all-cause mortality? Yes, it was all-cause mortality. It was consistent across all of them. So what, what I was wondering is that does, does loneliness pick off one particular cause? So, for instance, is loneliness associated with increased cancer risk or is loneliness associated with increased heart attacks or increased diabetes? Okay. Now, of course, at some stage, I'll, I'll ask the question because I'm sure everybody in the audience, we've got so many friends now in terms of Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. How can we be lonely when we've got so much and so many connections? Uh, probably for the, probably the, the person who's probably most used to using social media, uh, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, who are the most vulnerable groups in terms of being lonely? If, if we look at, for instance, sorry, Kerry, I'll, I'll bring the Red Cross in very soon, but answer away. Now, you've mentioned that loneliness does not discriminate. If we were looking at uh, chronic disease prevalence any, anywhere in the world, even if you're looking in Melbourne, the socio-demographic uh, status is actually very, very important in terms of increased disease in those who are more disadvantaged. Uh, is there any association with loneliness and disadvantage in terms of socio-economic disadvantage? I cracked them. Can I be lonely in a group? 
I'm touched by the similarity between the discussion that we had a number of decades ago with regards to the destigmatization of uh, depression and mental illness, in, particularly in, in Victoria, of course, throughout, throughout Australia. Uh, how do we know that somebody's lonely? Kerry, can you expand a little bit on the Red Cross as interest in loneliness and what the Red Cross as ambitions are to try and eliminate loneliness? During this evening's presentation, we've heard that loneliness can affect people of any age. Do we tackle loneliness in the same way across all ages? Or do we have to have a specific, I hesitate to use the word intervention uh, because of the connotations of intervention. Um, do, do we have to use a, a different tailored approach for adolescence compared with your mid-twenties, compared with your forties? 
and older. You've, you've touched on, on the, the term co-design and Julianne mentioned co-design earlier on in one of her responses as well. Um, before moving to Swinman, I would have had no idea what co-design means. Uh, there might be a few people in the audience who don't as well. Can you just elaborate on the, the concept, the process of co-design in, in, in relation to developing a loneliness intervention? Are there challenges or dangers in involving the clients in the design process? Do are there challenges from a psychological point of view in raising issues with the lonely people? For me, the way I can conceptualize um, loneliness is so that the things that we actually um, have to do sometimes make too much for them and they can Ladies and gentlemen, I think there's going to be a roving microphone, so if anybody's got pressing questions, you don't have to wait for me to ask them uh, in the last 10 minutes or so. So just raise your hand and I can't see anything out here, but raise your hand and yell out if you've got a, a question. Sort of there. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, we have heard about the, the UK. They've got a, a ministry for loneliness or a minister for loneliness. Do you think that we should have something similar in Australia?
there was a question from the floor. Yes, my, my question, Ed, what a wonderful research and study that you're doing, it's fabulous. Um, regarding connection and loneliness, I wonder if you've also looked at um, people's connection to nature and to animals, to pets, to nature, to animals, um, to their, uh, some people will have a connection to God, to church, to spirituality. Was that considered at all? So in our analysis, wanted to uh, kind of uh, ask for your opinion uh, regarding <laughs> mic check <laughs> my voice has more power than I expected <laughs> <laughs> so here I am and yeah so um, um, you touched briefly upon the, the social neuroscience which is uh, heavily embedded in the evolutionary uh, kind of uh, conceptualization of where we are and I'm wondering to what extent what we are seeing is, uh, you know, the out outcome, the symptom of um, us uh, prioritizing only part of the Darwinian uh, findings, which had to do with, you know, survival of the fittest and, you know, promoting that paradigm and not promoting the paradigm that is to do with the other key component that Darwin was also talking about in several books related to compassion, prosocial behavior, collaboration, cooperative, coexistence, which is more prevalent in uh, the collective cultures, the oriental cultures, and not as much in our cultures. And I wonder how does it pan out cross-culturally as well, this phenomenon? And secondly, how does that uh, um, fit into that idea of how much is enough? You know, so kind of a related question. We are m mostly interested in, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, gratifications. So this hedonic kind of approach to life, the pleasure, accumulation of goods as opposed to eudaimonia, which Aristotle was talking about and which is also part of the spiritual practices and that pans out to be working maybe in oriental cultures. Is it some study that is touching upon those issues? Sorry for complexity. <laughs> That's my age. <laughs> for two more quick questions. Uh, the lady fifth row in the middle. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
First of all, thanks a lot for the lecture. It was really interesting. And I'm here. <laughs> and the question is about the differentiation between loneliness and being lonely. Like, how, how has it been taken in the studies? Because, uh, well, you were saying that not necessarily loneliness is related with depression, but then how is it identified? Because not necessarily being alone, it's feeling lonely. Just one or two comments. Uh, most people here want to experience that. My experience is that when I was young, society was basically a community. We were all interacting, we were playing, we were having fun at school and all the rest of it. Today, society is individualistic. And I think the main reason for that is modern technology. When I go on the train to Melbourne or whatever, Eight out of ten people sit there with their iPhones, their iPads, their gear. No one talks to each other. When I was a teenager, we would all talk to each other. And I'll give you another comment. I always go to Wilson's prom in January. And in the prom, all the sites have no power. And you would see the difference between the atmosphere there, the kids and the teenagers, they're all playing, they're all having fun, they, they hide and seek, balls on the beach, everywhere. And a couple of years ago, they were going to introduce power. The whole camp voted against it. Because as soon as you introduce power, then you'll have computers, televisions, all the other gadgets, and you won't see anybody on the street anymore. So that's the basic difference. And to, to, to finish off is, you might, there's a very easy, maybe not easy, but there's one solution. And you may have heard this before, but at one stage in the Bible, the disciples asked Jesus, what is the biggest commandment? And what did he say? Love God above all and love your neighbor as yourself. If we would all love our neighbor, what you talked about wouldn't exist. It wouldn't okay. exist. We would all interact. So one with this concept I think we all need is this concept of my team. The group of people that I nominate, it might include my pet, uh, that I nominate to be with me in good and bad times. And I've got, I'm the leader of the team, I've got a deputy leader, and they, they kick in when I'm not able to lead the team. And every day, you know, there might be a, an alert, how are you tracking, is it a smiley face? Or, I mean, it might sound a bit trite, but it's, we, we're going to try and test it um, in sites across Australia where we worked with those consumers to design this solution. And then we want to take it to scale and give it to whoever else, other organisation that's partnership stuff, uh, because we think it has quite significant application. Um, so I do think we should be trying it. We should be testing and we're building the evidence in to see what impact. It may not make any difference and then we can modify and keep adapting. But I think those types of solutions, and there's many, many others that others are also experimenting with are worthy of experimentation. Julianne, would you like the last word? Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, that draws to an end this, this evening. May I, on behalf of the Australian Red Cross and Swinburne University of Technology, uh, thank you for your support in, in coming out here. I, I do hope that you found the presentations educational as well as inspirational. And please join me in thanking our panel members. From the